Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, uh, good morning, FaithBridge. How we doing? All right. It is uh, great to be back with you for a second week in a row. Let me just uh, real quick uh, tell you how grateful I am for this place, uh, just the support that this church has shown to us and the work that we are doing with Vertical in Waco has been phenomenal. And so it is such a privilege to be back with you today. As I was preparing, I couldn't help but think that life a lot of times can be like the dance floor at a wedding reception. And I realize that that's going to need some explanation, but um, uh, I'll explain it this way. There's going to be moments when you're at a wedding reception sitting there and something like this is going to begin to play. It's uh, it's the Cupid Shuffle, if you're not familiar. It's the Cupid Shuffle. And the uh, the Cupid Shuffle is a staple at, uh, at wedding receptions. And, and when the Cupid Shuffle comes on the speakers, there's really only one right response, and that's for you to stop whatever you're doing, get up from your chair, make your way out to the dance floor, and engage, okay? And the reason, it doesn't matter whether you're 7 or 70, you're most likely going to get up and make your way to the dance floor because the Cupid Shuffle is exciting, it's enjoyable, and it is easy. All you have to do is watch someone do the Cupid Shuffle once, and I guarantee you, You're going to find yourself moving to the right, moving to the left. You're going to start kicking. You might even walk it out. I don't know what you will do, but most likely that that's what's going to happen. The Cupid shuffle, it, it, it creates this moment in wedding receptions that are extremely exciting, and it brings a lot of joy to the moment, and it's just easy. But then there's a song change and something like this might come on. Dust in the wind. Dust in the wind. And uh, the hard thing with Dust in the Wind is that uh, it, it's, not a, it's not a slow song or a fast song. And so it's really tough to figure out how to dance to it. I mean, it's not a slow song, so you don't slow dance. I mean, a few of you do. There's always that that couple who has been dating for like two months and so they're pretending that this wedding is their wedding and they uh, slow dance to every song. If that's you, you need to quit it, all right? But it uh, doesn't matter what's playing, you just slow dance. It, Dust in the Wind's not a slow song, but it's not a fast song and so it's not really something that you just kind of find the, find the movement for. And so what happens? Well, because it's awkward, it's uncomfortable, it's painful. Everyone begins to communicate to the DJ, it's time to move on, and you communicate that by clearing the floor. See, this is what life can be like. There's times in life where the Cupid Shuffle is playing, and life is exciting, uh, it's enjoyable, and it's easy. I mean, everything in life just fits. It all works out. You don't have to try hard at life, it just, it, it works. But then in a moment in time, the sun can change and you find yourself in the middle of dust in the wind. And life is awkward, it's uncomfortable, and it's even painful. The only difference between real life and the dance floor at a wedding reception is you don't get to sit out on the songs you don't like in life. You know, some brides and grooms have the option to choose the songs that are played at the reception. Well, you don't get to choose the songs of your life. You just get to choose how you dance to the songs of your life. And the reason I tell you this is, is because I would imagine that there's plenty of people here right now who are in the middle of the Cupid Shuffle, and life is exciting, enjoyable, and easy right now. And if that's you, awesome. But then I would imagine that Plenty of people here are standing in the middle of dust in the wind, and life is awkward, it's uncomfortable, and it's even painful.
painful. This morning as we step back into the book of Ecclesiastes, what we are going to get is dance lessons from King Solomon. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 is going to be King Solomon's way of instructing us how to dance to the good songs and the bad songs. So if you have a Bible, I want you to turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And what I want to do is I just want to read you the first eight verses of the chapter because these eight verses are a beautiful poem written by King Solomon. Here's what he says. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Do those words sound familiar at all? Even if you have never read Ecclesiastes chapter 3 in your life, I guarantee you've heard them. You heard them here. You guys remember this song from the birds, 1965? Some of y'all are having some groovy flashbacks right now. 1965, the birds came out with the hit song, Turn, Turn, Turn. And what you need to realize is Turn, Turn, Turn is simply Ecclesiastes chapter 3 put to words. And I like that because what that shows us is that King Solomon was responsible for a number one hit, which is pretty (laughs) amazing. That's pretty awesome. What we're not going to do right now is go line by line through this poem and and unpack what each line means, because what you need to realize is that this poem is not prescriptive, it's descriptive. What I'm saying is this poem doesn't tell us how to live, it simply tells us what life is like. And I think we can actually capture the point of the poem just simply by looking at the first line, okay? Look at what Solomon says right after he says, for everything there's a season and in the time for every matter under heaven, what he says is this. He says, a time to be born and a time to die. Okay, this is just one example out of the entire poem, but and I think the, what we can get from this lo- one line will give us the entire meaning, what Solomon is going for. Solomon says there's a time to be born. And what's his, what's his point? He says, well, you know what? Everyone has a birthday, But what you need to realize about the day that you're born is you had no control over that day. You're here because you're here. It it has nothing to do with choices you made. You have no control over the day you're born. If you think about the birth of your your child or your children, you have zero control over when your children are born. I mean, you can go to the doctor, and the doctor can do a pretty great job predicting around what day your child will be born. But he cannot predict the exact moment that your child is coming. I remember when my wife was pregnant with our first son, Noah, the doctor said, September 11th, that is your due date. Well, uh, late on September 9th at about one, one in the morning, really the morning of September 10th, I woke up to my wife sitting on the edge of the bed, and she said, I, uh, I'm not sure if I'm in labor. So being the loving, compassionate husband I am, I told her to go back to sleep <laughs> because I didn't want to get up until she was certain she was in labor. Turns out Noah was heading out, and we went to the hospital, and Noah came on September 10th, not the 11th. We had no control over when Noah was born. But when he came, what did we do? We celebrated because it was a great time of joy. I mean, despite all the mean things a woman can say to you when she's getting another human being 
out of her body. It was a great time of joy. And Noah's life changed everything about our lives. See, there's a time to be born, but then there's also a time to die. And the day you will die is just as unpredictable as the day you were born. And you have just as much control over the day you die as you had over the day that you were born. If you think about the timeline of your life, this being your birth, this being your death, where do you think you are right now in the timeline of your life? Maybe you think you're right here. Maybe you think you're right here. But the reality is you could be here, but you could also be right here. We have no control over it. What's the point of the poem? Here's what Solomon is getting at. Life is completely unpredictable. Life is constantly changing. And it's going to be full of times of joy and times of sorrow. And you ultimately have no control over any of it. But there is one who has complete control, and that's God. And Solomon points us to that in verse 1. Look back at what he said. He said, for everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. I want to read you the same verse from a different translation. The New American Standard puts it this way. There is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event. Under heaven, do you hear that? There's an appointed time for everything. Who has appointed the times? Well, that's God. God is the one who has set every song for your life. He is the one who has determined the playlist for your life. Every season has already been chosen by God. And Solomon wants us to be clear. God is sovereign and he is in control. Now watch how Solomon builds this argument. Verse 9, he says this, What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. So again, Solomon's point, the point he's trying to drive home is that God is sovereign and in control of all things from beginning to end. God is in charge and he is in control. Solomon is trying to adjust our view of God. He's trying to adjust our view of God. Let me uh, just read you a couple more verses which are gonna shed light on really what Solomon is talking about. Isaiah in chapter 46. Verses 8 through 11 says this, Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand. I will accomplish all my purpose, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country. I have spoken and I will Bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. God's saying, I'm God and you're not. There is only one God and it's me. And I have a plan from beginning to end. I have a purpose and I will accomplish my purpose in all of creation. We move from general to personal. David says this in Psalm 139, verses 14 through 16. He says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. What was written? the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. So what he's saying is from beginning to end, all of your life has been mapped out by God. Here, here's the point. Here is the, here's the thought. Solomon is trying to adjust our view, our understanding of God. And what he wants us to be clear on is that God sees the beginning of time and the end of time at the same time. 
And God knows how everything is going to play out because he has somehow planned it out. And this is what makes God so unfathomable because God is never the inventor of evil and God never infringes upon our free will, our ability to act and think and make decisions. Yet, he is able to bring all things together in a beautiful and perfect way. Let me illustrate it a different way so we first have the the wedding reception illustration, let me, let me put it in a different light. In 1998, a movie came out with Jim Carrey called The Truman Show. I wanna show you the, the movie poster for The Truman Show. Here's what, it, here's what it looks like, and where you're sitting, it might look like it's pixelated, but it's actually a mosaic, and each of the little boxes that you see out are um, scenes from the movie. And so if you were to look at the different scenes, some of the scenes are scenes full of joy because everything is as it should be. But then there's other scenes that are full of sorrow because nothing is as it should be due to people's sin. Yet somehow all of the different boxes, all of the different scenes of the movie weave together beautifully and perfectly into one big Mosaic. You need to know your life is a mosaic. Your life is comprised of countless boxes and scenes. Some of those scenes are going to be full of joy. Some of those scenes are going to be full of sorrow. Here's what we, dis- we determine from the poem. Life is it's, it's completely unpredictable, and it's always changing. You are changing from scene to scene, and in some of these scenes, everything is going to be as it should be. In some of these scenes, nothing is going to be as it should be. You have no control over any of it. But God sees the entire mosaic of your life all at once, and he is weaving every aspect of your life together in a beautiful and perfect way. The reason that Solomon is trying to adjust our view of God is because if we don't have this view of God, if we don't realize that God is sovereign and in control of all things, life can be extremely frustrating. And we see that in verse 11. I don't know if you if you captured what Solomon said, but let me just read it one more time. He says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in the man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. This is a verse full of frustration because what it's saying is God has made everything to fit together beautifully and perfectly. God sees the entire mosaic of our lives all at once, not just our lives, but all of creation. He sees it all at once. And there's this longing in us to be able to see what God sees. Something in us longs to be able to zoom out and see how everything in our lives is gonna fit fit together. But we can't. All we can see is the present. All we can see is the one small box, the one little scene that we are stuck in in this moment. Just think about that real quick. Which, what box are you in right now? What scene are you in right now? Is it a good one or a bad one? I would imagine that, that some people here are in a really good scene right now. Maybe you just got into a dating relationship and you're still in that gross, giddy phase, okay? Maybe, maybe you're in a, a moment where your marriage is just, it's just clicking, it's just working, it's, it's easy. You're thinking about writing a book on marriage. I don't know, it's just working. It may be more like a pamphlet, I don't know, but it's just working, <laughs> it's working out. Maybe you got a new job, maybe you got a promotion, maybe a raise, I don't, I don't know, but, but maybe you're in a good box, a good scene right now. Everything is as it should be. But then I would imagine that others are in a bad moment, a bad scene, a bad box right now. Maybe there's, there's heartbreak in your life because of a relationship, a broken relationship. Um, maybe you've lost 
a loved one. Maybe you've lost your job. And I'm going to say something that I hope is, is just kind of a, a relief. Or maybe, uh, uh, hopefully what I'm doing right now is just kind of stating, saying what you wouldn't be willing to admit to other people because it doesn't sound godly. But it can be really hard to love God sometimes. It can be really hard to love God sometimes when all we can see is the present. Because we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that God has made all things beautiful in its time, but when you look at the one box that you're in right now, there is little to no traces of beauty. And it can be hard to love God when there are little to no traces of beauty in the scene that you're stuck in right now. Here's the good news. Just because you can't see God doing something doesn't mean God's not doing something. Do you hear what I'm saying? Just because you can't see God doing something doesn't mean God's not doing something. What you need to hear is struggle well, be faithful, because God sees the entire mosaic of your life all at once, and he is weaving things together in a beautiful and perfect way. God never wastes a hurt. He never wastes pain. And for some reason, God has decided that the mosaic of your life would somehow be incomplete or less beautiful without this scene in it. So struggle well. Watch how Solomon continues. Verse 12 now is when his dance instructions for us are gonna get very practical. He says this, I perceived that there is nothing better for them, that's for us, than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. Let me unpack these verses by telling you about how Christmas has gone for my son Noah the last couple years. Noah is now five. The last two years, I, I feel like we have tried our best to teach Noah the real reason for the season. That's Jesus. But my son has just been obsessed with presents, okay? I mean, we have, we've worked on it, but he's just, a, and there's nothing wrong with presents, but this is the way our Christmases have gone. Noah will go to the tree, he'll get, in a, get a present, he will unwrap it, he will look at it, he will set it to the side, he will not say thank you, he'll run back to the tree, get another present, unwrap it, look at it, put it to the side, not say thank you, go to the tree, grab another present, unwrap it, look at it, set it aside. He doesn't say thank you. And then when all the presents are gone, he comes to my wife and I and says, hey, what else you got for me? All right? (laughs) Hey, don't you judge me. All right? We're working on it. But I look at Noah and I just think, this is what we can be like in life. When we find ourselves in the midst of the Cupid shuffle or we find ourselves in a box or a scene that's good, that feels like it's full of gifts from God. What we do is we take a gift, we unwrap it, we look at it, we put it to the side, we don't say thank you. We take another gift, we unwrap it, we look at it, we put it to the side, we don't say thank you. And we do this over and over and over with the gifts that God gives us. And then when there's a scene change or a song change and it doesn't feel like God is blessing us or giving us the gifts that we want, we come to him and we say, what else you got for me? And because he doesn't seem to be dispensing what we want, we go and look for life elsewhere. So we can find ourselves as Christians in this rhythm of life where we are ungrateful in the good times and unfaithful in the bad times. Solomon right here is saying, don't let this be the case for you. No, if God is showering you with gifts, don't take anything for granted. You be grateful. Be grateful for everything. Every good and perfect gift is from 
above. So after church today, if you go to a restaurant and you have an incredible meal, the type of meal that makes it hard for you to walk to your car because it hurts so good afterward, you praise God for it. If you have a good conversation, just a good five-minute conversation with your spouse today, you praise God for it. You have a good workout tomorrow, praise God for it. If a meeting goes surprisingly well, praise God for it. If you have one of those five-minute windows where your kids are really well-behaved and you start thinking, man, I'm a good parent, like praise (laughs) God for that moment. Don't take anything for granted. You come in under budget one month on some bills, praise God for it. Do not take anything for granted. You find yourself in a bad scene in life. You find yourself in the midst of dust in the wind. Life is awkward, uncomfortable, painful. Solomon's words to you are do good, struggle well. Here's one thing I know. Sometimes when we are hurting in life, we pacify our pain with sin. Psalm's saying, no, struggle well. <clears throat> struggle well. If your heart is broken, Jesus is the healer of the brokenhearted. If you're stressed out, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. If you're lonely, Jesus is a faithful friend. Solomon's point is this, be grateful in the good times and faithful in the bad times. Do you hear what I'm saying? Be grateful in the good times. Our problem is so often, even in the midst of all the gifts that God will give us in the good times, we are constantly, we are obsessed with the next scene, the next box. God, what's coming next? And because all we're doing is looking ahead, We never pause to enjoy the now. Be grateful in the good times, faithful in the bad times. Watch how uh, Solomon finishes up this passage. He says this, verse 14. He says, I perceived that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. So we've established that God sees the entire mosaic of our lives, not just our lives, but of all of creation all at once. He sees how everything is going to fit together beautifully and perfectly. All we can see is the present. Something in us longs to be able to zoom out and see what God sees. What Solomon is saying here is, if you had that opportunity, if you had the opportunity to zoom out and see how everything in your life and all of creation is going to piece together, You wouldn't sit there over God's shoulder tapping him, offering suggestions on what needs to be tweaked. Now Solomon says, you know what you would do? You would fall on your face and worship. That's it. If you got to see what God sees, you would fall on your face and worship. The only right response to God is to fear him. We talked about this last week. To fear God is not to be afraid of him. It's to stand in reverent awe of who He is. When you see him for who he is truly, then to fear him is to respond rightly to who he is. Solomon says we stand before him reverently and we worship him because he is sovereign and in control and weaving everything together beautifully and perfectly. The good news for us is that John in the book of Revelation actually took some time to write down a picture of the mosaic that God will one day pull together. The mosaic of creation that God will ultimately pull together. Uh, It's found in Revelation uh, 21, and I just, I want to read it to you. This is what God is going to ultimately do. You can close your eyes if you want to just be able to capture it, but here is what God will ultimately do. It says this, 
Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her, for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Yes, life is completely unpredictable. Yes, life is constantly changing. Yes, life is going to be full of times of joy and times of sorrow. And yes, you have no control over any of it. But we know the one who has complete control over all things. Jesus Christ. And when we step into a relationship with Jesus Christ, understanding that he died for our sins and rose from the dead, we have access to the Lord of lords and King of kings. And when we begin to see Jesus for who he is as a sovereign ruler over all creation, we realize that the only right response is to declare today and every day, Jesus, your way is the best way. So this week, whether you find yourself in the midst of the Cupid shuffle or dust in the wind, May we be people who are grateful in the good times and faithful in the bad times because we know the one who makes everything beautiful in its time. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we just declare that you are the sovereign ruler over all creation. You are in complete control. Lord, I know that there's plenty of people in this room this morning who are in the midst of a sweet scene in life. You have them in a great box right now, and I pray that they would realize every gift is from you, Lord, that they wouldn't take one thing for granted. May we be grateful people, Lord. But I also know that there's plenty of people here who are stuck in a bad box right now, a tough scene. Lord, may we be faithful people this week, Lord. We praise you, Jesus, for who you are and what you've done for us, Lord. Thank you for the hope that we have in you, that you, God, see the entire mosaic, not just of our lives, but of all of creation, and you are making everything beautiful in its time. And so you are trustworthy. We love you. We trust you. We worship you. And we just confess, Jesus, your way is the best way. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Timothy Atik from Vertical Ministries. He was back with us again this week, bringing a message from Ecclesiastes 3, A Time for Everything. Welcome. Glad, Glad to, to have here. you back again. Always yes, good last to be week here. was awesome and continued. This week was such a great message Thanks. from Ecclesiastes. Um, we had lots of questions come in, yep. mainly around some of the same themes. Um, one of the first questions we had to come in, you know, was around community. Yep. Um, can you speak to the importance of being in fellowship with uh, people who are in the same or different season of life with you? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I, I think about what Solomon says. You know, in the next chapter, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and he just gives these beautiful pictures of the idea that two are better than one. He talks about how, you know, there's a better return for your work. So if you're 
living life together, you, you can be more productive. But then he says, if you fall into a pit, it's always nice to have someone there mm. who can pull you out. And I think it has everything to do with what we talked about today. You know, it, it's good to, to walk through life. God has wired us to live life in community. And those people can be there in the good times to, to remind us to be grateful people. But especially in the bad times when it comes to being faithful, we need men or women around us who are going to, to help us walk uh, God's path for our lives. Because I think, as I said today, a lot of times in the midst of pain, we pacify our pain with sin. And uh, we need people in our lives who can just kind of provide some boundaries and remind us of truth so that, you know, our feelings don't take over mm. and lead us astray. That's so good. Okay, so a lot of the questions came in around, around this. And I think anytime we talk about God's sovereignty, the questions arise about what is, what is my free will? How does that look? Do we really make decisions? How, how does that balance out? And a lot of the questions are around that. Can you speak yeah. to that too? Well, so I, I'll just start off by saying, you know, it, it would be impossible for me to, to address this in a five, 10 minute video, something that people have been arguing about and debating for not just a few years, but hundreds of years. And um, I, think, I think the best thing I can say, at least in my own personal convictions, is the Bible teaches both, mm. teaches uh, God's sovereignty and man's free will. I mean, the, the verse that I always think of, which I think puts the two back to back is John 1, 12 and 13. It says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So if you stop right there, you think just free will, like it's, it's all up to me to choose God, mm -hmm. to receive him. For as many as received him, those are the people that Jesus gave the right to become children of God. But then you keep reading in verse 13, it says, these people were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Mm -hmm. So you see free will, yet you see, man, uh, you see man's free will, yet you see God's sovereignty. I think that the Bible teaches both. And the Bible does not give us all of the information we need to, to see how these two interact with one another and complement one another correctly. And I, I, think that, I think that that's okay. Mm -hmm. And I think that God has been intentional about it, it being that way. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think about what Paul says in, in Romans chapter 11, he says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable are his ways for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor. It's just this idea that God is infinite and we're, we're not. Our minds are so limited. Our ability to understand what God understands, mm -hmm. we, we just don't have it. Yeah. And so when it comes to nailing down, is it God's sovereignty or man's free will? The answer is yes. The Bible teaches both. In um, you know, the studying I've done, people either lean really hard on God's sovereignty mm -hmm. or they lean really hard on man's free will. And I think that that does a disservice to the scriptures, which teaches that man is responsible, mm -hmm. yet somehow God is sovereign. And so if anything, it should just draw us near to, to worship him that we can't fully comprehend everything. Yet I'm, re I'm responsible to know God's word and to walk in it. So don't get caught up on, mm -hmm. do I really have free will? Well, you, you think and you act and you make decisions, make mm -hmm. those according to the Lord. Okay. Is God sovereign? If he's not, I don't want to know him. You know what yeah. I mean? He, he can be so trusted. God, yes. so. Great, thank you. Um, and so another question was asked, um, it was asked this way, does God put things in our lives to see how we will react? I, um, I totally understand what the, the question is going for. I, and I think it's a great question. I think the way it's worded can make God out to be, um, you know, an, an imperfect father. God mm -hmm. is a perfect father. So to, to put things, it's almost like he's, you know, 
trying to get us to, to mess up. Maybe that wasn't the way the question was going, but it's really a question of does God test us? Like, mm -hmm. will He put things in our path to test us? And the answer is absolutely He will. And James 1 talks about it. It, it talks about the testing of our faith in, in God will will put things in our path that will absolutely challenge our faith. He will put us in situations where we have no choice but to trust Him. And James says that the testing of our faith produces endurance. So God does put things in our path with an ultimate goal of expanding our dependence upon Him, expanding our faith in Him, so that we would be more fully functioning followers of mm. Of Christ, that's what trials will do. Is it will, it refines us, it presses out the impurities in our life, draws us back to Him. Well, let's talk more about the trials and the suffering okay. because a lot of questions came around that, which yeah. you made very good about being being grateful in the good times, being just being grateful. Yeah. And then the the side of that is if your, your season is one of struggles or just be faithful in that. So practically, what does that look like? Is faithfulness something that we just um, muster up? Like how, how can we be faithful in those times? Yeah, well, the, the first place I have to point you is to the, the fruit of the Spirit. Faithfulness is one of the, the fruit of the Spirit. And so when I talk about being faithful in the bad times, I'm not saying you just need to, you need to, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You need to muscle through it. It's all on you. No, what I'm really calling you to do is to press into the Lord more and and ask for Him to sustain you. Um, even this morning, I was asking the Holy Spirit to fill me, mm -hmm. to fill me up, because I felt low mm -hmm. on the Spirit. And so every day we need to ask the Spirit to fill us with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. So it, to be faithful in the bad times, is it, it starts with a deeper dependence on the Lord mm. of just saying, God, I cannot get through this apart from you. So I need your strength. I need your wisdom. <laughs> I need your joy to be the thing that sustains me through this. Um, but then the, the, other, the other thing is, I, I always tell college students, you can't know the will of God without knowing the Word of God. Mm. Um, and, you know, one of my favorite pastors, he, he said, I love this, he said, feelings are real, they're just not always reliable. Mm. And, you know, when you get in a really tough time, y your feelings can tell you to do all sorts of things that are contrary to the will of God. And just because it feels right doesn't mean that it actually is right. And so that's why it's so important to know the Word of God because then you will stay in the grooves of the will of God. So, for example, if, you, um, if your marriage is really struggling, feelings might tell you you have a right to be happy. Well, I don't find that verse in the Scriptures. What the Scriptures call you to do is it's it's not about feeling love it's about choosing to mm -hmm. love love is patience patience is a choice love is kind that is a choice and so that that type of faithfulness a lot mm -hmm. of times is going to be doing the opposite of what feels mm -hmm. right and so that's why it's so important to be you know saturating your your life with the word of god when it comes to employment if you've been out of employment for a while there can be this this uh, tendency to to compromise some some standards in terms of who you're willing to be and what you're willing to do, and you might step into a position where you have to make decisions and operate in a way that would compromise your character and integrity, and that's not what God is calling you to do. If this makes sense, and so that the the Word of God will help you to walk. Um, in the will of God and to do it with people around you. That's what it's going to, that's how you're going to get from, you know, how you're going to make it through the, the tough times. That's what it looks like to be faithful is to submit yourself to the leadership of the Holy Spirit every day, but then to read the word and to be a doer of the word. Good, good. This message was great. And I, I know um, many people 
needed to hear about the seasons, especially myself. Yeah. Sometimes you get into seasons and you think you might not ever get out of it. Yeah. Um, but just such a good reminder to be grateful and to be faithful. And so thank you for bringing that today. You and bet. thank you for being back with us. You bet. And thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.